Russia's invasion of Ukraine may somehow be keeping oil prices lower. At least kind of. Sound strange? Let me explain. Following the surprise attack on Israel, broader tensions in the Middle East boiled over. Oil prices correspondingly spiked, causing a global economic downturn and sending Western leaders into a spiraled panic. That sounds like it could be the story of 2023, in the wake of Hamas's October 7th strike on Israel. But it is not. Instead, this is the story of 1973 and the Yom Kippur War. In the aftermath, King Faisal of Saudi Arabia led Arab countries into an oil embargo on the Western-aligned states that supported Israel, notably the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, the Netherlands, and Japan. Prices spiked from the now quaint-sounding $3 per barrel up to $12 per barrel. Suddenly, demand for more fuel-efficient cars emerged, speed limits were instituted to reduce gasoline consumption, and President Richard Nixon even tried banning Christmas lights. He would, wouldn't he? In contrast, the Christmas lights are alive and well in 2023. On October 5th, right before Hamas's attack, prices of Brent crude oil closed at $84.58. When markets opened on October 8th, the price had only moved up to $86.35. Now, they had gone as high as $92.85 on October 19th, but even that is nowhere close to the 300% increases circa 1979. Instead, by November 8th, prices declined to an amount even lower than before the crisis began. And fast forward another month, the prices had receded even further. So why are we not observing oil crisis part 2, gasoline boogaloo? Well, there are three big things that make today different. One is the more straightforward evolution in political alignments in the region. Put simply, the major players have moved on from the levels of ideological opposition to Israel. A more subtle change is that the United States is self-sufficient-ish for fuel. Thus, the coercive power must be more focused on wrecking the global economy, and less about specifically bankrupting the United States. Finally, the less straightforward bit is the difficulty of maintaining cartel prices. Ironically, Russia's aforementioned invasion of Ukraine makes it difficult to enforce the cartel supply plunges necessary to create an economic crisis. Let's start with the straightforward part on geopolitical alignments. A war in Gaza, or in Israel for that matter, hardly has a direct effect on oil prices. I will leave it to 1970s Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir to explain. Let me tell you something that we Israelis have against Moses. He took 40 years through the desert in order to bring us to the one spot in the Middle East that has no oil. Combat over there is consequently not lowering the supply for oil on the world market. Rather, this is a pure political problem, where pals of Palestine prefer punishing places that provide pistols to Israel. But a lot has changed since 1973. Egypt, then Jordan, then the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco, all normalized relations with Israel. Perhaps most importantly, Saudi Arabia appeared heading in a similar direction on the eve of the war. Now, as a practical matter, only two of the countries mentioned, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, are members of OPEC. That is, the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, and yes, the THE is supposed to be there, as weird as it sounds to the ear. Concerns about the articles aside, this is the worldwide cartel geared toward curbing oil supply, so as to increase global market prices. But the point of the 1973 ban was for Arab states to prove to their peers how dedicated they were to the Palestinian cause. Fast forward to today, and while the Arab world is far from pro-Israel, many see practical utility from moving on from the hardline stance. Thus, while Iran keeps trying to propose some sort of action, the Arab response has been tepid. Heck, they cannot even get a consensus on embargoing Israel specifically. Second is the evolving nature of U.S. oil dependency. As the 1970s began, 
U.S. oil demand began vastly exceeding domestic production. Something had to be done to keep the pumps in the country from running dry. The Middle East was central to the solution. The pyramids may not have been flowing with black gold, but 83% of U.S. oil imports came from the broader region. As a result, during the embargo, it was not uncommon for gas stations to literally run out of fuel to sell. Moreover, the sun was nowhere close to setting on the problem. Even two years after the embargo, Gerald Ford found the American position dire enough to ban the export of U.S. oil. Wait, is that what Donald Rumsfeld looked like when he was young? And that's Dick Cheney? With hair? Anyway, times have changed. The U.S. shale oil boom has led the way here, with higher global prices justifying the more expensive extraction process. In fact, Obama lifted the Ford-era export ban in 2015, and we are going to reach, or already have reached the point, that the United States is a net oil exporter. That said, this does not mean that Washington would benefit from global supply shocks. In 2022, the United States still imported about 6.28 million barrels of crude oil per day, with Canada basically running laps around the competition on that front. The imports are, in part, a complicated legacy of decisions from the past, where current domestic production is not a perfect match for existing refinery capacity. As a result, OPEC nations can still cause headaches simply by cutting general output. Oil is a global commodity. If Saudi Arabia suddenly cuts supply to a random country, say, India, Indian consumers will start looking to buy elsewhere. Producers, possibly perceiving prodigious petrol prices and preferring to pump peak profit potential, will set sail for the more lucrative market. Oil prices elsewhere therefore increase, to keep everyone from heading to India. Obviously, this helps Canada. But ironically, it also helps the U.S. oil industry, especially given those higher extraction costs from shale deposits. Nevertheless, the United States has a vested interest in avoiding that. Gas prices are a centerpiece of American politics. High prices hurt U.S. consumers and generally suppress global trade, which the United States disproportionately benefits from. All of this is a long way to say that OPEC can hurt the United States. But the 1973 level of petrol coercion against the West over Israel is a bygone era. However, there is one more thing standing in the way of coordinated cartel action. Russia's war in Ukraine. The irony here, of course, is that wars are generally supposed to make oil prices go up. And indeed, that is what happened following the start of the invasion. But there is a more complicated dynamic at play with enforcing cartel prices. The tension here forms a classic prisoner's dilemma, as those silly game theorists call it. Two parties, Saudi Arabia and Russia in our example, can either produce oil at the market rate, or cut outputs. Market rates generate market profits, and a tidy sum of money for both parties. Meanwhile, mutual curtailing spikes sales prices, allowing both to obtain higher profits despite lower output. The problem here is that each side has a temptation to cheat on the deal. For example, if Russia continues to produce as normal while Saudi Arabia cuts back, market prices will still increase a fair amount, but Saudi Arabia only gets a small piece of that pie, while Russia starts rolling in the rubles. All of that logic is vice versa when Saudi Arabia continues to produce while Russia curtails. Now Saudi Arabia is showering in the dollars, while Russia feels the sting. Now here we have the perverse thing. In a one-time interaction, no matter what Saudi Arabia does, Russia is better off with market-level production. To see why, let's reset. If Saudi Arabia goes with the market, Russia gets more money by going with the market as well than by cutting. And it is the same if Saudi Arabia were to cut production. More for Russia if it goes with the market than if it cuts. 
But Russia's incentives are not special. The same is true for Saudi Arabia. If Russia were to go with market rates, market makes more than cutting. And if Russia were to cut, Saudi Arabia still gets more from the market than by cutting. Consequently, the central tendency of both parties is to follow the market forces, even though both would profit more by cooperating to lower supply. It is just that the unilateral temptation to break a gentleman's agreement sabotages the sustainability of the better outcome. Now, the classic solution to this problem is repeated play and the shadow of the future. In practice, Russia and Saudi Arabia have to keep making production decisions month after month. Saudi Arabia could propose to Russia that it will scale back its operations despite the short-term temptation to cheat that everyone is well aware of. However, it will watch what Russia is doing and condition its long-term choices on Russia's actions. If Russia also cuts back production, then Saudi Arabia will continue to collude on artificially low supply. But if Russia tries to take advantage of the situation, Saudi Arabia will flood the market the first chance that it gets. Suddenly, the calculus for Russia is not so simple. If Russia plays Saudi Arabia's game, it can secure a good outcome over the long term. This for the first unit of time, and again the next time, and then again, and again for the foreseeable future. On the other hand, if Russia cheats Saudi Arabia, it can get a very good outcome for the short term. The problem is that the next unit of time will deliver a poor payoff, and so will the time after that, and after that, and so forth. This is because Russia's defection triggers Saudi Arabia's punishment. Riyadh orders production at market rates and denies Russia great profits. In that light, if you want to maximize total payoffs, clearly the Saudi gambit is the better way to go. The problem is that states are not always the most patient of creatures. OPEC is well aware of this, because lack of patience is a large reason why the cartel is notorious for its struggles to live up to its full potential. This reliability concern goes double when the state in question is in the middle of a very expensive war. Budgets are flying out of control at record-setting levels, and its leadership is also facing disgruntled citizens unhappy with supply shortages. Lest anyone forget that the Soviet Union's fall was in part due to the inability to keep up with military spending. Seriously, Russian defense spending is projected to go up to 6% of GDP next year, about twice what the United States does on average. In other words, any OPEC member looking to partner with Russia and cut supply is going to be nervous that short-run war concerns will trump Russia's long-term profit motives. To further add to the irony here, the fact that Russia is so tempted to take this means that it cannot even settle with a string of these, and instead is stuck with a stream of those. Now, Russia's external concerns do not make sapping supply impossible. In fact, in March 2023, the Kremlin worked with the cartel and committed to cutting production by half a million barrels per day. Quotes there because this is international relations where commitments have a nasty tendency to vanish into thin air. And, predictably, Russia was slow to implement that promise. Side note here for a video at another time. When a deal does get done under these conditions, Russia actually benefits from the impatience. But explaining why gets to a level of math that I do not want to touch right now. Another bit of irony here is that Russia is not even a member of OPEC. It is a part of OPEC+, Plus, which sounds like a streaming service that no one would want to purchase, but is actually a group that formed to expand the cartel's conversation to more states. It also reflects the reality that Russia is the world's second largest oil exporter after Saudi Arabia, and that any serious cartel action needs Russia's cooperation to succeed. All of this caused so many problems, that the scheduled November 2023 OPEC meeting was first delayed, and then moved online. When they finally did get around to talking and announced voluntary supply cuts, 
the market seemed to not believe anything serious would happen. Oil prices actually dipped a little bit following the announcement. Meanwhile, I had an announcement of my own a couple of weeks ago. The release of my new book on the strategy of the Russia-Ukraine war. You can also check out this classic that uses the conflict to explain why wars occur more generally. Caution, lines on maps. Nixon may hate Christmas lights, but he can't stop you from making these great stocking stuffers. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Take care.